Hello, I'm June Edwards and welcome to the first class for fall semester 2021 for senior topics. This is our brain health awareness and we do it <clears throat> to keep all of our brains sharp and functioning and keep us happy and healthy. And a lot of the subjects we talk about are for stimulating conversation. You can talk with your activity director. If you are the activity director, I want you to know there are discussion questions on the Canvas app that you can go to through noce.edu, E-D-U. Again, if you have your own laptop or computer and you want to go on it for yourself, noce.edu, using your enrollment number, which you already have been assigned, and you can go on and you can see there's all kinds of reference materials and pictures that you can use and all kinds of things for you. Now, I thought we might be face to face by now, mid-August, but there's a variant out there. And, you know, viruses have been having variants for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. So there's going to be an ebb and flow with what's going on. So it may be a little bit longer before we are actually able to be together face to face. But that's OK. We can do it this way. So to get started, I want to give you the calendar events for the third week of August. Starting on the 16th, International Homeless Animals Day. It is also one of my favorites, National Tell a Joke Day. So if you know a good joke, I hope you'll tell it. It's also Roller Coaster Day. The roller coaster was patented and released on August 16th, 1898 in time for one of the world's fairs. And it was an instant hit. Never slowed down since. August 17th, Davy Crockett was born that day in Tennessee in 1786. Remember the Davy Crockett show back from the 1950s? And you'd wear your coonskin hat and say, Davy, Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier, born on a mountaintop in Tennessee, killed him a bear when he was only three. And I don't remember the rest of it. Da, 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 da. And it was a Davy Crockett, and I believe. Now, I know that Fess Parker played Daniel Boone in a rival show about the same time. And I don't know the name of the actor who played Davy Crockett, but they're both American heroes. Uh, August 18th is when the movie The Wizard of Oz premiered with Judy Garland and many famous former vaudeville actors in 1939. She was actually a lot older than the girl Dorothy from Frank T. Baum's books, but they made her look like she was younger. They gave her pigtails. She's actually about 16. They originally wanted Shirley Temple to play in the movie, but she was under contract to a rival studio. So that's when Judy Garland got her big break, got to sing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, and the rest of that it was history. Looking now at August 19th, it is National Aviation Day. And boy, have we come a long way in the last hundred plus years with aviation. Uh, the former president, Bill Clinton, was born in Hope, Arkansas on August 19th in 1946. He's one of the baby boomer presidents. It is Potato Day. August 20th this National Radio Day. And I found out a lot of interesting facts as I researched the radio entertainment business for us. 
it's also mosquito day so you got to slap yourself once in a while i will tell you i found something that works really well to repel mosquitoes and that is baby oil you don't want to burn yourself smothering on baby oil like we used to want to do but the baby oil does repel fleas Okay, we're back. I will tell you that when we have hot weather like this and it's 94 degrees outside, we do tend to get knocked off the air by our faulty internet system. I'm using Spectrum, but it doesn't seem to matter what you use. I also have an ether cable, which is supposed to be 10 times faster than the wireless networks. But when we get knocked off, just grab your coffee mug. I've got my iced tea. Take a sip and relax and just wait. I guess that's good for our brain too. learn a little patience. Nobody likes to wait, but we all have to learn to do it, right? So that's pretty much it. Uh, I did want to say that also on the third week is air conditioning appreciation week you can see i've got my fan up there behind me i don't have to turn it on right now because my ac is rolling along just fine but you never know so thank god for air conditioning especially in southern california right when did you first experience air conditioning because I remember back in when I was in school, back in the 50s, and I guess I'm giving my age away, and the 60s, the only trick we knew was to go to the drinking fountain, take wet paper towels, and hit certain points on our body, our forehead, the back of our neck, the front of our neck, the elbows, and in the knees, and that was instant cooling us down because we didn't have AC in those days. It was too expensive for the schools. And also when we tried to get air conditioning later when I was teaching in the 80s and 90s, they said it would be a luxury tax until kids started getting nosebleeds and fainting and everything else. So now, of course, the district offices were the first ones to get the AC, but eventually it did trickle down to the classrooms. And now just about every school I know has some kind of air conditioning. In 2018, there were one and a half billion, billion air conditioning units installed. And it's an estimated 20% of energy use in buildings around the world. It is expected to grow to $5.6 billion by 2050. And <clears throat> United States is, or United Nations is saying, well, we've got to have green energy. We've got to cut back on AC. Not on your life, baby. No way. They say try passive cooling, evaporation cooling, selective shading, wind catchers, and better thermal insulation. Well, as long as they can figure out a way to keep us seniors comfortable, that's what we're going to go along with, right? So anyway, with the history, it goes all the way back to the ancient Egyptians. They used what's called passive uh air conditioning because in Egypt it can get up to 130 degrees on the desert 
the Sahara Desert. And so they built extra tall buildings so that the hot air would rise. They knew which ways the wind patterns were blowing and they had open porticles for the wind to go through. They had people fanning in certain directions and they also had runners who brought ice and they would fan behind the ice and get the cooling of the ice to blow through. That was for rich people. Poor people had to sleep up on their rooftops in the summer. There wasn't much else they could do. So, uh, you know, we've moved on since then. In 1558, GM Batista de la Porta used chilling ice to temperatures far below its freezing point by mixing in potassium nitrate. And they started experimenting with artificial freezing. In 1758, Benjamin Franklin, remember him? And John Hadley, a chemistry professor at the University of Cambridge conducted an experiment to use evaporation as a means to rapidly cool something. The 19th century included a number of mechanical developments in what was called compression technology. In 1842, a Florida doctor, John Gorey, used compressor technology to create ice and he used it to cool air for his patients in his hospital in Florida. And you know how humid it gets in Florida. In 1851, James Harrison created the first mechanical ice making machine in Australia. And he was granted a patent for an ether vapor compression refrigeration system. And once we had electricity in the works, it was able, we were able to get first modern electrical air conditioning with Willis, Willis H. Carrier in the United States, 1901, 1902. And by 1906, they were exploring ways to add moisture to the air. So electricity really helped. And by the time the 20th century was more than halfway over, people were using portable in-window air conditioners. That was by 1945. And as they say, yep, now there's all kinds of them. And they've got all kinds of systems that they're looking at. They're changing out some of the air coolants that they were using because they supposedly uh, hurt the coral out in the ocean somehow. We're back. Tell a joke day is August 16th. How do you celebrate that? Well, there's a few things I can think of. Number one, every time you meet a person on that day, tell them your favorite joke. Number two, pick up a joke book. I've got one about lawyers that I really like as I had to go through probate on a relative's will. And it helped me to keep a sense of humor reading all these jokes about lawyers. Uh, watch your favorite comedian. I like Jerry Seinfeld. I like Bob Hope with Bing Crosby on the road series of movies. And I'm sure you have your favorite comedians, Lucille Ball. Lucy and Ethel got into all kinds of trouble together. And I'm sure you have some that are even more recent. Uh, and what you can do is you can watch your favorite comedians on TV or through a stage play. 
if they're back open again. But the best thing I think is let your grandchildren tell you a joke. I have one my granddaughter made up. What do you call a frog crossed with a rabbit? A frog crossed with a rabbit is a bunny ribbit. I think that's kind of cute for a 10 year old, don't you? And they thought about that all by themselves. Okay, and why do we love National Tell a Joke Day? It makes us laugh, it makes us happy. You might be considered the life of the party. And it's good for your health. You know, uh, the good book says, a merry heart does good like medicine. And there have been studies conducted that show that people's health improves when they're in a good humor. So if you, you want to senior citizen joke, okay. Let me see here if I got a good senior one. Okay. Here's a lady who said, uh, who was being interviewed by a local news station. She's 80 years old. She had just gotten married for the fourth time. The interviewer asked her questions about her life, what it felt like to be getting married again at 80, and then about her new husband's occupation. He's a funeral director, she answered. Interesting, the newsman said. Then he asked her if she wouldn't mind telling him a little bit about her first three husbands and what they did for a living. So she had to think for a few minutes. After a short time, a smile came to her face and she said first she married a banker when she was in her 20s. Then a circus ringmaster in her 40s a preacher in her 60s, and now in her 80s, a funeral director. The interviewer looked at her quite astonished and said, why did you marry four men with such different careers? She said, I married one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. Ha! Okay, and that's a good senior citizen joke. Moving along then to our next subject. August 20th is National Radio Day. And I used to be in radio years ago. I was one of the first women hired back in the 1970s when the FCC, Federal Communication Corporation, made it a mandate that more women needed to be hired under the Affirmative Action Program. I was the first woman hired at a network in San Francisco. And boy, did I get great treatment. I remember when I first tried out, I was asked by the uh, station manager, young lady, do you have your FCC license, operator's license, which you had to have in those days? I said, no, but I'm on my way down there right now to take the test and I'll be back with it in two days and I was hired. So you had to learn a lot more about the technical aspect of radio. What's a wattage? Uh, what do you do if your station gets knocked off the air? Not too different from uh, computers getting knocked off the air now by internet waves. Well, radio <clears throat> has had a long and controversial history. There's some debate as to who actually invented the radio. We do know in 1893, the inventor Nikolai Tesla, yes, Tesla, who the new car is named for, demonstrated a wireless radio in St. Louis, Missouri. But the person most often credited as the father inventor of the radio was Guglielmo Marconi. He was awarded the very first wireless tele telegraphy patent in England in the year 1896. He also, when Tesla filed a patent for his basic radio in the United States in 19, uh, 1897, for some reason there was a holdup and his patent request was not granted until 1900 four years after Marconi's patent was awarded. 
It wasn't until the 1970s, the Supreme Court gave back to Tesla and some of the other earlier inventors, some of the recognition and rights that they deserved that had gone to Marconi. But Marconi's place in history was forever sealed when he became the first person in 1901 to transmit signals all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Now before and during World War I, it was the military that mostly used Morse code to transmit signals to ships out at sea. And they also liked the fact that they didn't have to send physical messengers anymore. They could send and receive messages to the armed forces in real time. In the 1920s, after World War I had been settled, civilians began to purchase radios. And a lot of them had home kits where they could make their own receiving or transmitting devices. <clears throat> well, that became a problem after a while, a problem for the manufacturers who were selling pre-made units. The Radio Corporation Agreement, RCA, was soon sanctioned by the government. Certain companies were allowed to make receivers. Others were approved to make transmitters. Only AT&T, Telegraph and Telephone Company, was able to chain broadcast from station to station across the whole country. Well, <clears throat> BBC handled the same thing and still does, the British Broadcasting Corporation in England, and they're still the main one sanctioned by the government in the United Kingdom. During World War II, radio was again very important to the military and also journalists because radio relayed the information of events that happened. There was one man, one operator who uh, sent his report from Pearl Harbor, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. He was not too far from the airport and he had an eyewitness account of what happened in the harbors, he saw a lot of the destruction. And when you hear his voice, it went over the telephone and then was broadcast over the radio to Americans all over the country. Well, also at that time, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt had started his fireside chats during the Depression era to explain all the different programs he was starting to help get us out of terrible economy. And also he wanted to let people know when we entered the war because of what happened at Pearl Harbor. And then he used his fireside talks to encourage the American people during the long war, as did <clears throat> Winston Churchill in his government position in England. Well, after the war ended, people wanted to forget about war. They wanted entertainment and music became very popular, especially by the early 1950s, the top 40s and rock and roll and dance music and also broadcasting sports games. Well, today radio has become much more than Tesla or Marconi could have ever, ever imagined back in the 1890s. You know, there was a period where we thought radio was gonna die and fade away. And that was in the 1970s. But thanks to a very innovative broadcaster, Rush Limbaugh, who used entertainment, he started a new format called Talk Radio. And today in the 2020s, Talk Radio is one of the leading, <clears throat> what, no matter what political side you're on, it's leading because uh, ordinary Americans can get on the airwaves and talk to millions of people and express their opinions about different current events. Also, you can find any variety of music you want, whether it's Mexican music, Hispanic, uh, Asian music, jazz, still top 40s, hard rock, classical music, uh, Southern gospel, any variety of music that you want. And there's drama programs still. 
So I think this is the second golden age of radio. Do you listen to radio yourself? There were different moments when radio helped actually bring Americans together. I told you about the fireside chats. Also, the very first national broadcast was 1920, the presidential election results. When Pittsburgh's KDKA aired live returns from the presidential election race between Warren Harding and James Cox, it also delivered the world's first commercial radio broadcast. And it lasted 18 hours from 6 p.m. on November 2nd until noon the next day. It was owned by the Pittsburgh-based Westinghouse Corporation, and they had just received their broadcast license six days before from the government. The returns were being with a 100-watt transmitter. Today, the giant stations are over 50,000 and cover most of the United States. The broadcast reached only an estimated 1,000 listeners, but it revolutionized how news could be delivered because it was happening in real time. Also, <clears throat> the Grand Ole Opry spread country music. In November of 1925, in a new show from Nashville's WSM radio station, there was a new show called Barn Dance, and they had the program's first ever performer who was an 80-year-old fiddler named Jimmy Thompson. He played foot-tapping old-time music, and his niece accompanied him on the piano. Two years later, the producer, George Judge Hay, changed the name of the show to the Grand Old Opry. They said they would offer a homier style of music than the Grand Opera show that preceded it on the air each week. Sears Roebuck was a major advertiser of that. At first, they opposed what they called the disgraceful breath, but fan letters came in by thousands. By 1930, the Grand Ole Opry had 30 regular cast members, and they built a 500-seat studio theater to handle what became as much of a live event as a radio broadcast. And you know, the Grand Old Opry is still forming in Nashville every week. And boy, did country music take off. People like Hank Williams Sr., even Dolly Parton, Bill Monroe, and many other bluegrass and country legends started because of that. The other one I wanted to mention real quickly before we have to go is the War of the World which was a science fiction dramatization. And uh, it was from H.G. Wells' sci-fi fantasy novel, The War of the Worlds. It was performed by a 23-year-old named Orson Wells at Mercury Theater. And you know, there were several thousand Americans who believed it was really happening and that there really was an interplanetary conflict that had started with the Martians. But they did find that uh, they said about 1 million believed it to be true, but the other 5 million figured it was some kind of entertainment. And after that, they had to put out some rules to let people know what on the air was fantasy and what on the air was the truth. And there's much, much more that we could talk about that has brought Americans together. But the last thing I wanna tell you real quick, National Aviation Day celebrated August 19th on the birthday of Wilbur Wright. It was Orville and Wilbur Wright who built the first functional airplane in 1903. And of course now, we have planes that can cover, carry hundreds of passengers. We have broken the sound barrier. We have flown people to the moon and a rover to Mars. And we're on the verge of making space flight available to civilians because we just had some civilians that we sent up an 18 year old and an 80 year old former lady astronaut. 
among others with some of the billionaires who are promoting future civilian space travel. It's just amazing what's happened. And also in a few days from now, August 24th, we'll be celebrating Amelia Earhart, the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. And then later on a worldwide tour around the world, she and her navigator mysteriously disappeared. And we only think that within the last year or two, we may have found remnants on a small island not far from Guam where they may have crashed, landed, and run out of gas too early. That's it for this week. Man, there's so much more I could tell you. Remember to check in with me whenever your activity director puts this up for your facility. You should also be able in some of the facilities to be able to see it on your own room television. So for now, so long, everybody. It's so good to be back and be able to talk with you and share some of these amazing stories. Keep your brain humming. Keep thinking. Bye, guys.